Chapter 18, Analysis of First Loss by Robert Schumann. First, let's take a look and a listen to the piece First Loss, which is on page 181 in your textbook. Robert Schumann's piece, First Loss, is from his collection of short piano pieces, Album for the Young. To determine the key, we look at the key signature, the notes at the beginning, the notes at the end, and any other clues that might be helpful to determine tonality. The key signature has one sharp. And that tells us that the piece is most likely in either G major or its relative minor key, E minor. However, it's always necessary to identify the tonal center of a piece to determine its correct key identity. The first note of the melody is G, but the last note of the piece in the highest and lowest voices is E. Most often, the very last note of a piece is the best determinant for key identity, but we should search for more evidence. The very beginning starts with a pickup note on G, but moves stepwise downward toward D sharp before resolving up to E and then skipping down to B in measure two. The D sharp is significant. It is raised and it is the leading tone in the key of E minor. And in measure one, we see it resolving up to the pitch E. Here's the E harmonic minor scale. and you can hear the D-sharp resolving to E at the very end. As already mentioned, the melodic line seems to come to a rest at the beginning of measure two with a dotted quarter note on the pitch B. This pitch, scale degree five in the key of E minor, is also significant as the dominant pitch is often closely associated with the tonic pitch in a key. We see this at the end of the piece as well. The B in the left hand in measure 31 eventually moves to the pitch E in measure 32. At this point, it is safe to say that the piece is in the key of E minor. And here's the evidence. First, the key signature has one sharp. Then, in the last measure, the last tones in the highest voice of the right hand and the lowest voice of the left hand is E, clearly establishing E as the tonal center. And the raised tone of E minor, the D sharp, that's the seventh pitch, is prevalent, and it seems to resolve upward to E. This is called the leading tone. The dominant pitch B also seems prevalent and closely associated with a tonic pitch. Let's talk about the form. Schumann seems to divide this piece into two parts. This is especially evident in the placement of the repeat sign in measure 16. And such a division implies binary form. Binary just means two. The piece begins with a clear motive characterized by a pickup note, a series of four eighth notes and finally, a downward skip. A motive is just a small idea that we hear in music that seems to be 
repeated in the fabric of a piece. Now, fragments of the shape and rhythm of this motive are found in the next several measures. Notice the two short groupings of the eighth note skipping downward to the dotted quarter note in measures three and four. And also notice the groupings of eighth notes resolving to the next measure in measures five and six. Now this is very common in music composition. Composers like to establish motives and develop the same material as the piece unfolds to give the piece a sense of unity while at the same time providing interest and variety. Now, notice that the shape of the phrase seems to be heading gradually downward from the high G at the beginning to the long dotted quarter note on F sharp in measure eight. You know, in fact, in measure eight seems to be the end of the first phrase as the melodic material for measure one returns in measure nine to start the second phrase. The phrase that starts in measure nine seems to be quite similar to the first phrase, measure for measure, we only notice a slight change in measures of 15 and 16, where the melody comes to a rest on the pitch E instead of the pitch F sharp that we heard in measure 8. Let's talk about cadences. You'll recall that back in chapter 13, a cadence is the term we use to describe the end of a phrase. Composers often use specific harmonic formulas along with a particular melodic gesture, usually a longer note value, to define the cadence and give some feeling of completion or arrival. In chapter 13, we compared this to the punctuation often used in grammar to denote phrases and speech. To better understand harmony of the cadences in the first section of the piece, it would be helpful to construct a chart of the primary chords in the key of E minor. Remember, we use a harmonic minor scale to determine these chords. Here's the first chord. The one chord is an E minor triad. And moving up to the fourth note, the A minor triad is the four chord, minor in quality. And moving up to the fifth note, this is the five chord, major in quality, also called the dominant. Now measure two contains the first complete triad. We'll take all the notes and arrange them on a separate staff, building up the triad intervals of the third. Remember, triads rearranged on one staff, all in thirds, as close as they can be, are said to be in their simplest root position. And this helps us to see clearly that the one chord in the key of E minor is present here. Often with piano music, composers like to make interesting patterns with the pitches resulting in harmonic activity that extends through time. But regardless of this interesting pattern in measure two, we can also see that the lowest note of the pattern is E. So the chord is in root position. Now the harmony at the cadence in measure eight is shown here. And to the right is the harmony rewritten in simplest root position, all in thirds, as close as they can be. Now clearly, these are the notes of the five chord, the dominant of the key. When a cadence ends on a five chord, it has a very incomplete sound, as we've discussed before. Such a cadence is called a half cadence, and it causes the phrase to have the quality of a question. What often follows is an answer to that question, or an answering phrase. This is what it sounds like. And there's the half cadence. Here's the harmony in measures 15 and 16 with the triads in simplest root position given to the right of each example here. Now there are two decorative notes in measure 15, I've got them circled, and we'll ignore them in our determination of the harmony. What we see here are the notes of the five chord, B, D sharp, F sharp. Measure 16 is much more clear in its spelling of the tonic, the one chord. The cadence ending on the one chord is a final cadence, and this causes the phrase to sound as a good consequent to the previous antecedent phrase. The formula of five going to one, as seen here in measures 15 and 16, is called an authentic cadence. Sounds like this. A much more complete sound. 
Now, in a minor composition such as this, sometimes there's confusion over whether the piece is using a harmonic minor scale or a melodic minor scale in its construction. Usually, the harmonic minor form helps us to create harmonies, and the melodic minor is used to construct the melodies. Here's the E melodic minor scale. As you remember, the melodic minor raises the 6th and 7th scale degrees from the key signature, ascending, that is when we're going upward, and then returns these pitches to their natural minor identities when the scale is descending. When looking for applications for the melodic minor in the actual melody, it's important to take note of the direction of the line immediately after the 6th or 7th scale tone to see if it adheres to the melodic minor concept. Consider this passage here in Schumann's first loss from measures 5 to 6. Notice that the sixth scale degree in measure 5 is written as a C natural. This is conforming to the descending version of the melodic minor scale. And here, yes, the C natural moves downward to the fifth scale degree of B, so it does seem appropriate to use C without a sharp. Now look at the D sharp in measure 7. Here the pitch is on its way up to E. So in this instance, it seems appropriate to use the D sharp from the ascending version of the melodic minor to strengthen its motion to tonic. You could go ahead and do check your understanding 18.3 in which you find other instances of the 6th scale degree C in this piece. Do they all seem to fit with your conception of what the E melodic minor scale should do, both ascending and descending?